Hey guys, we have a couple attendees here, but we will give people a couple minutes to join and then get started. Hey, everyone who's starting to enter, we're just um, going to give it a couple more minutes before we get started. I feel like I should be playing some nice like elevator music as we wait here for everyone to join. Is anyone a good singer? <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask how about the guitar. Oh, right, perfect. Right. <laughs> we have our reading yeah. music. Uh, I don't think you want to hear that right now. I'm pretty out of pocket. <laughs> <laughs> My stairway to heaven so How's everybody's Black Friday? On you all have people waiting. Good Black Friday. Expected, unexpected. Yeah, feel free to um, introduce yourselves in the chat, um, but also you know, share any of your Black Friday successes. Yeah. Taylor, Canopy, hey. Faye, I love that you got like the entire team on this, so it like blows up the stats <laughs> on attendance. That's awesome. The least we can do. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Charlotte? Yeah, I think that we can go ahead and get started here. Um, awesome. Well, thank you all for coming and joining our webinar uh, post Black Friday, Cyber Monday 101 on how to retain your most expensive customers. I am Charlotte from the Bridge team and I run partnerships. Um, so just to kind of kick us off, I'd love to take a second to look 
back um, at Black Friday, Cyber Monday, um, this obviously presents a massive opportunity to convert both your on the fence uh, prospects and win back lapsed customers since you're offering the steepest discounts of the year. Um, but that means that these are your most expensive customers to acquire for two reasons. You're offering extremely steep product discounts and you're also running really expensive campaigns with the cost per clicks and everything like that. Um, so as a brand owner, you obviously want to minimize the cost of acquisition and simultaneously increase your customer LTV. And the way that we can do that is through retention. Um, so I am joined here with three experts from the space, Faye from Source Medium, Ben, or sorry, Michael from Postpilot, and Kate from Bridge, who are going to help us by answering some of these burning questions about our Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and the customers that you obtain during this time. So what is the typical LTV of these customers? What are the best practices for retargeting these customers? What are some of the most common habits of Black Friday, Cyber Monday customers? How should you continue to engage with them after their sales? Since they, these customers have a really high cost of acquisition and low spend, what does that mean for your relationship with these customers moving forward? Um, what data is important to be collecting from them? And how long after Black Friday, some Cyber Monday, should you begin your retargeting campaigns? Um, so with that, I will pass it over to you, Faye, to introduce yourself, um, and we can go from there. Thank you, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to start my timer so I don't go over. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to to share some of the insights that we've gathered. Um, so so essentially, uh, I'll quickly just kind of go through what we do and, and leave most of the time on the, the potatoes of what we've done here. So. Uh, we are an analytics company for high growth uh, omnichannel and e-commerce brands. Uh, and the, the, really the short of it is we help you answer your most important analytical questions out of the data that you have. So if there are analytical questions that you have been having trouble with answering uh, with your current setup, then uh, it's definitely worth a conversation with us. Um, so what we're going to sort of focus on today is uh, uh, to, to give everybody an overview of some of the high level trends that we pulled from a sub segment of our of our customer base. And of course, with these kind of benchmarking things, you know, it's very important to know what kind of uh, brands are in this cohort, you know, and we have a very specific cohort here. Right. So uh, uh, all of these brands are in the 10 to $100 million in annual sales, uh, most have achieved consistent year over year growth. Um, you know, many are omnichannel, although we're just purely looking at uh, DTC uh, channel for, for this particular webinar. So the first thing we're gonna be looking at is, uh, oh, and then the time range, we're basically uh, going to be looking at from the beginning of 2019 all the way till the end of November just now. Um, so one thing that's encouraging to see here is that it's going up, right? Um, so, so we're still seeing growth across uh, our cross section of brands, despite a lot of the uh, more discouraging sentiments that we've been hearing more recently. Uh, so, so we kind of marked wow. some of the key events here, like the COVID lockdown, iOS announcement, iOS 14 announcement and launching the recent stock market crash. So one of the things that we see here, for example, is 2020, of course, was a very special year where we saw over 100% growth in sales uh, relative to 2019. And then in 2021, we see that kind of more reversion to the mean where uh, we're still growing, which is really crazy to see on, uh, on, on top of 2020. But the growth rate has uh, slowed, right? Uh, uh, but one thing that's, that's cool to see here is uh, we still saw a 26% year over year growth for this November. Uh, hopefully that is the right kind of signal that we're looking for, for what's to come in 2023. Uh, and then lastly, you can see that, uh, uh, you know, during the stock market crash uh, earlier this year, you know, it, consumers aren't necessarily responding to those kind of events that we in the industry are very much uh, paying attention to. So how you uh, uh, go about uh, changing your strategy relative to those, to, to those events may not always be connected to what consumers are responding to. 
So if we look at the spend trend here, uh, you know, it's it, if you squint out, it looks similar, but there's a lot of interesting things here. You know, so if we zoom into 2020, uh, we're seeing that uh, uh, there was a bit of a lag uh, from when the consumer demand really spiked to when the spend actually caught up. Um, um, and then going into 2021, we see that spend continue to accelerate over 100% year over year growth you know, even though um, sales are not actually growing that kind of a way. So you can imagine a scenario where marketers are, are doing their end of year planning and perhaps projecting into 2021, hey, you know, maybe we're going to have the same kind of growth. And that's where um, some of those mismatches can happen. The other thing that's interesting here is, uh, of course, after 2021, spend began to, to really stabilize and uh, all most recently in November this year, we see that there was actually basically no growth in spend, uh, even no. though we still had that natural acceleration in terms of uh, uh, e-commerce adoption uh, in sales regardless. And the last thing here is if you look at the stock market crash, uh, almost everybody responded with an immediate drop in, in spend uh, in May 2022-ish. Uh, even though, you know, as you can see here, consumer demand is not necessarily changing that in that kind of a way. So <clears throat> there may have been growth that was left on the table, right? If, if we're not responding to the right signals here. Uh, we then further broke down the spend data into um, a, a few different ways. You know, one is to look at the, uh, by platform. So of course, Facebook remains the bedrock of any digital marketing strategy, but that has plateaued essentially, uh, you know, throughout 2021 and now. And uh, a lot of the growth really kind of came from Google, you know. So, uh, uh, so Google has been a big winner here in terms of iOS 14. Uh, you can see that they're, they've been allowing advertisers to diversify their spend within Google. And we see, we see YouTube and Shopping and Performance Max actually reaching uh, to, to uh, half of all the Google spend at one point. Um, and then the, the, the last thing here is seeing the rise of influencers that, which is the pink part of the chart here, right? So that really became very visible visually here starting, uh, uh 2022, uh, specifically. And of course, that's also going to be driving a lot of the brand level performance that we're seeing. So TikTok, uh, we're, we do see it growing very fast, but of course, as you can see here, it's still very minuscule, it's actually very visible. So. Um, so, uh, uh, in 2023, that could very well change. And then we also broke this down by tactics. Um, so as you see, as brands grow, um, you know, uh, there is an increasing focus in diversifying away from prospecting and really trying to figure out and crack retargeting, but, you know, it's still below kind of what we recommend in that 15 to 25% of spend going to retargeting. Uh, we're generally seeing around 10% right now. Uh, so, of course, that requires a lot more uh, sophisticated setup and making sure that the retargeting setup is correct and, and having enough of a spend budget to, to, to have enough of a retargeting pool. And we also do see, again, the rise of influencers and brand, which are going to be probably growing hand in hand because that's what drives a lot of brand awareness, which then turns into, uh, you know, branded searches um, on Google. <clears throat> so, uh, CAC is going up, right? So, uh, of course, uh, folks have been saying that. So from what we see here, uh, you know, we see a pretty positive correlation between increasing spend and increasing CAC, right? So a lot of that spend isn't necessarily turning into, uh, direct conversions, but of course, in an omni-channel setting, a lot of them could be, uh, uh going over to Amazon and retail. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, but we do see that the uh, spend as a percentage of sales is stabilizing and CAC is, uh, has began to stabilize uh, in starting Q4 of last year. <clears throat> and that's very important because, you know, uh, average revenue per customer, which is the lower right chart here, is not growing um, the same way that CAC is growing, right? So it becomes pretty important here to, to essentially keep CAC consistent and really begin to experiment with how do we how do we start cracking average revenue per customer here uh, with uh, things like price testing, increasing prices, bundles, upsells, um, etc. 
Um, so uh, uh, one of the things that, of course, uh, uh, with this rising CAC environment is, uh, um, you know, it's going to create a lot of chaos in the business unless you have something that is more stable, like cost per order, right? So that's kind of what we're seeing. Uh, as spend went up, CAC is going up, but cost per order is staying relatively stable, right? So that's, that's what can create stability there. And, uh, and, and to keep cost per order stable, the ability to, to convert existing customers becomes pretty key. So on the lower right-hand chart here, we can see uh, new customer acquisition has more or less stabilized, even though this November, we see a lot of new customers being acquired, which is really encouraging. But we really kind of see after COVID, the consumer habits of buying online really showing here showing up here and also the brands uh, focusing on uh, uh, reconverting existing customers. So we can see the purple line really kind of starts to pull uh, uh, and that has, that trend is continuing. So looking at these repeat purchaser behaviors, you know, uh, we kind of honed in on to the Black Friday, Cyber Monday weekend explicitly. And what we're seeing here is most of the cost, most of the repeat purchasers that came back were actually acquired in the range of six to 24 months um, after they were acquired, right? And uh, so, so that's why it's important to be building a relationship with your customers over time. And when these kind of big sales event comes, they're going to be ready to purchase. And what we're seeing is pretty consistently uh, discounting as a percentage of gross, uh, gross sales. Uh, stays pretty consistently around 15%, right? So, so we can kind of deduce that, that that's kind of the floor of what people are going to be expecting on this, on this weekend is 50, at least 15% um, um, in sales. So to understand a little bit better in terms of where these repeat purchasers are coming from, we got into repeat conversions uh, in terms of last click uh, channels uh, using things like UTAs and discount codes and et cetera. So subscription still is the most prevalent, um, although the, the, the percentage of that uh, as a percentage of overall for November uh, has been actually coming down year over year. And we see a lot more direct visits, direct communication channels like email, SMS, and direct mail. And also um, uh, we do see that Google takes a lot of credit here, which is kind of one of the, the challenges with last click. Uh, and that's combination of organic search and Google. So to, to address that, we kind of layer in uh, some zero party data in terms of how did you hear about us? And uh, what's kind of cool here is influencers and affiliates becomes overwhelmingly the case, right? And of course that makes sense in the sense that, you know, if you hear about the Black Friday sale from Tim Ferriss, people are gonna say Tim Ferriss, not necessarily YouTube, TikTok, uh, Instagram, whatever. So. Um, so, so cracking influencer attribution is, is very, very important here. Uh, and also then layering in on what channel that's actually working, um, and then doubling down on working together with them on that is going to, uh, achieve pretty significant results. So some quick takeaways here. Um, so rising CAC, right? So, uh, it's important for us to be balancing that through experimenting with increasing average mm -hmm. per customer repeat purchases and of course that's going to uh, uh result in like superior ltv performance and everything mm -hmm. else um so so knowing what the levers are knowing what to check right checking for cost per order uh, uh the strategies that are possible here using alternative mm -hmm. marketing channels mm -hmm. like direct mail um and, and subscriptions is going to be a, a very important strategy here and then also seeing the rise of influencers and affiliates becoming more important part of the marketing mix. Uh, it, you know, and I think a lot of being able to attribute these sales uh, uh, away from Google taking a lot of the direct traffic and last click purchase credits, having zero party data there, uh, uh, whether that is through a post purchase survey or uh, a QR code on packages and direct mailers allowing customers to tell you where they're comfortable, where they heard you from is going to be a pretty key uh, piece of insight there to, to, to add on to your attribution strategy. And then lastly, uh, it's important to, to make sure that there's a proper data setup for, for allow, to, to allow for actual and trustworthy 
insights. You know, there is no real attribution cure all if uh, you know some of these fundamentals are not addressed, right? So having proper and consistent UTM setup and naming conventions, having post purchase surveys and QR codes to collect uh, uh, zero party data from your customers using um, well thought out discount code naming conventions uh, and campaign prefixes, right? Having uh, campaign and affiliate specific landing pages and correct parameters uh, will allow for uh, the, 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 the proper type of post campaign analysis that's needed to, to really understand what's working. So um, that is all. I'll hand that over to Michael. Thanks, Faye. That's awesome. Uh, and I've I've used Faye's platform, and it's it's awesome. The the data and and cohort analysis and things you can get from it are are really powerful. So, thanks for sharing a lot of those insights. Uh, I am Michael from Postpilot. I'm one of the co-founders and co-CEOs. We're a direct mail automation platform specifically for e-com and direct to consumer brands. Think of us like Clavio for postcards. So here, I think Charlotte alluded to this at the very beginning, the dirty little secret, particularly around, for, for D2C brands, particularly around Black Friday, Cyber Monday, is while revenue looks really good, if you actually look at your bottom line, it might not look so good because you're typically paying higher tax and you're, you're discounting more aggressively than you do during the year. So margins are compressed. And so the secret, you know, the, the dirty secret of a lot of D2C brands even outside of Black Friday, Cyber Monday, is they're often not very profitable on that first order. So they need that repeat business where they're not paying that, that initial cap to drive profitability. And Casper's one example here, this was a graphic that I took from Scott Galloway. And basically what this, what this is saying is Casper would be better off stuffing the mattress with $300 and sending it to you for free than their actual unit economics based on their customer acquisition costs. The only way to make these businesses profitable is to get repeat business. And Casper actually hasn't been very successful at that. And that's why uh, their stock price is what it is and they got taken private. So how do we do that? One way is, is through direct mail. And, and I'm sure a lot of you have been hearing more and more about direct mail recently. So why is it so popular right now? Why is it kind of coming back around and, and becoming popular again with direct to consumer? and e-commerce brands and a couple key reasons. One, we all know iOS 14, like the bane of all of our existence, uh, really impacted people's Facebook ROAS and ability to track and target your customers. 96% of people didn't opt in when it was released. So it's really putting a lot of pressure on, uh, on acquisition, particularly through Facebook and social channels. Uh, two, Digital overload. So again, we've talked about CPAs continuing to go up. Email engagement continues to be pressured as people get more and more, their inboxes get more and more cluttered. Average email open rate for uh, e-commerce brands is only 20, 25%, which means a large swath, 70, 80% in some cases of your best audience, your existing customers and people that have opted in to hear from you aren't actually receiving your message. So again, think about you've got all your customers, but only a fraction of those are actually hearing from you if you're only relying on channels like, like email. Uh, again, take a look at your open rates. The majority of folks aren't, aren't getting that message. Whereas with direct mail, you can reach 100% of your customers and they get darn close to 100% open rates. So that's why uh, you, uh, that's why more and more brands are turning to direct mail to supplement some of these digital channels and reach all those customers that are harder to reach through digital ads and, and digital marketing channels. Reason number three, it just works. Physical, tangible, uh, direct mail pieces are more memorable. They stand out. They stick with you for a longer period of time. And as evidenced by all these amazing stock photos of smiling people, that just people do respond well to direct mail pieces. Again, you're not holding on to an email campaign. Email campaigns are fleeting. They're forgotten in a second, whereas people hold on to direct mail campaigns uh, for a long time and they remember them because they're more unique. So a couple of the, couple stats, like I was alluding to, 
over 90% of people read their direct mail campaigns uh, versus about 20% for email. Think about it. Even if you're, even if it's junk, even if you're taking out all of your mail from the mailbox, you're still skimming through it and looking through it. And if it's from a brand that you recognize, you actually pay attention to it and you have to make a decision before you discard it. Whereas with email, most people are just ignoring it altogether. It goes to your junk folder or your spam folder, uh, or you're just deleting it without even reading it. Lifespan on a, po on a postcard is over two weeks. Whereas again, email, digital ads are very fleeting. They're forgotten in, a, in an instant. And the response rates are significantly higher through direct mail. And of course, uh, you have to consider that direct mail is more expensive than sending an email. So you need to have higher response rates, but the, the economics really do work out. All right, you've convinced me that's something to pay attention to. How do I actually use this channel in Q4? And we call it Q5 because a lot of the brands we work with are in the health and wellness, food and beverage space where New Year's resolution season kicks in and they it's like second Christmas for all these brands. A lot of these brands actually do better in January, February than they do in, in, in November, December, particularly the health and wellness brands because everybody's ignoring their diets in November and December and then they go back on them in, in January and February. So where do I start? Uh, some easy places, second purchase and a win back campaigns. So think, I just, uh, we just sold you a product. We sold you a 30 day supply of supplements or a 60 day supply of supplements. If that brand doesn't come back within 65, 70 days, they, they haven't responded to our email campaigns, trigger a card on day 65. That's like, Hey, Faye, it's time to come back and get your new supply of, of supplements. Uh, you can do replenishment campaigns. So there's one here for Overtone, a hair coloring brand. Um, again, it's, you've run out. It's time to, to restock. You can cross sell. Think, I just sold you uh, uh, a pair of jeans. Wait 15 days. Send that customer an offer for a t-shirt. And reactivation. So one of our mutual customers for Sigmatic did this super successfully where they went back three years and we broke it out into all these cohorts using tools like Source Medium to break out these different segments and cohorts of customers based on recency and frequency. Uh, and you can see, we can segment each of those audiences and send them these campaigns and see with precision how did each of these, camp how did these, each of these cohorts of customers perform. And they actually got positive ROI going back over two years to customers that had not bought in over two years, had not responded to digital campaigns and they reactivated them successfully with a win back reactivation campaign. And again, it's where you make all your money because these are customers that you've already paid to acquire and you need to increase the LTV and get them back on track. And the great thing about these types of consumable brands is they're not just making, once you win them back, they're not just making one purchase, they're making multiple subsequent purchases over time. You've gotten them back into their regular routine. So they make a bunch of additional purchases before they potentially defect again and then they need to be reactivated again. One thing I'll also point out that you've seen on a few of the cards so far is the QR codes, best practice, tools like Bridge that can make that super easy and effective and create some really compelling experiences. QR codes have really made a big comeback and are now one of our best practices that you'll see on the vast majority of our cards. Another quick win, Christmas and New Year's, it's not too late. We were with, with Postpilot, you can have a campaign launched in days. Uh, so. It's not too late to send, you know, if you've if you're extending your Black Friday sale, if you got a new year, uh, a new year's campaign coming up, there's still time to get that out. If you've got great gift ideas, you can uh, put that onto a postcard and get it to all the people that haven't engaged with your email campaigns recently. Holiday season, great time to to acknowledge your best customers and thank them for being such passionate, loyal customers and supportive supporters of your brand. So one way to do this really inexpensive, inexpensively and easily is with a handwritten card. We actually have robotic technology that holds a pen to paper and writes with all the nuance of a human hand with individually personalized cards. And so you can create a card like this that just thanks your best customers, wishes them happy, hol wishes them happy holidays, 
and it's just an unforgettable touch point. How, how often do you get a hand addressed, hand stamped letter sent to your house with the, uh, with a handwritten note inside from somebody, you're you're gonna remember that and you're gonna uh, really spread the word and stay loyal to that brand. And then as we get into that Q5 period in the new year, so as I mentioned, lots of these uh, new year, new you campaigns, health and wellness, self-improvement apparel, cosmetics, some of the categories that are used that, that particularly lean into this period uh, again, of year's resolutions, and you can get that launched and, and get those customers uh, that haven't bought from you in a while or that kind of got off their routine over the holiday period and get them back and reactivated. And let's not forget about some ways to acquire customers. I know Faye was talking about that earlier as well. So one of the easy ways to do this with direct mail is we have a tool called Mail Match, which helps, which takes your Klaviyo email leads. So people that have not placed an order, but have opted into your list by email, and we can find a postal address for them and retarget them with a physical postcard. And again, it's a great way to ensure that those, those email leads, those prospects that have demonstrated engagement and intent with your, with your brand, they've given you their email address, but they've never purchased They've gone through your welcome sequence. You've tried to get them uh, to nudge them towards purchasing. They haven't converted. Hit them with a direct mail campaign. And this campaign from Orbit Baby got a 16X ROI by just giving them that extra nudge uh, and, was, and reached them in a way that they weren't able to be reached because they weren't responding to the email campaigns. Will asks, is that GP3, GPT3? Uh, it's not, we're, we're writing that, we're helping craft that, that messaging, but um, GPT-3 is pretty awesome. I've been like going way too deep on that over the last three or four days. Um, so last slide, the one, the, the quick pitch here, Postpilot, Clavio for postcards. We're, we're D2C operators at heart. We've been in this for 20 years. We've built a product that we know works for direct to consumer brands. It's in our DNA. We'll do the whole thing for you. We have a full team from design to account strategy and account management. We can literally do the whole thing for you. So the quick win is go to postpilot.com forward slash GFO. It stands for Godfather offer because it's an offer you can't refuse. We'll literally do the whole thing. We guarantee that you'll hit an ROI. Uh, and if you don't, we'll, we'll give you your money back. So that is my quick pitch. And I will then uh, turn it over to Kate who can expand on all the cool things you can do with QR codes. Awesome, thank you, Michael. Hi everyone, I'm Kate. I am the CEO and co-founder of Bridge. Bridge is a no-code platform for omni-channel brands to build QR code activated mobile experiences to own your customers and drive repeat sales. So I think if there's something that you've heard from Faye and Michael today, retention is extremely important. Um, so how do you think about, you know, owning that customer that you've acquired from, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, you know, maybe from your own channel or, you know, other channels to ultimately, you know, drive those repeat sales. So, um, you know, the name Bridge actually comes from bridging the relationship between brands and customers and bridging the offline and the online. So as Michael kind of mentioned about people liking physical, you know, we're thinking about how we can, you know, bridge your customers regardless of where they're shopping um, and using that QR code to make it really seamless. So I'm gonna talk about why 2022 is the year of the QR code um, and how you can use the QR code to um, leverage some of your retain and nurture campaigns with those Black Friday, Cyber Monday uh, customers, and then some tactics around best practices for QR codes um, and strategies to make sure that you're being most effective. So, you know, just quickly on QR codes, it's not a new technology, but it's really a, a new consum consumer behavior driven the pandemic. Um, it's, it's created this entirely new behavior um, where, you know, contactless menus, it's really become ubiquitous. Um, you know, in fact, 90% of consumers have scanned a QR code in the last month. Um, and, you know, QR codes are here to stay. And, you know, what we can help you do at Bridge is just make it really frictionless to engage that offline customer, whether it be through a you know post pilot campaign, um, and be super action oriented about what is that 
um, value that you can deliver to the customer and what are you hoping to do? So whether that's acquiring first party data, um, you know, telling your brand story, um, but with this goal of ultimately driving reorder and retention. And so, you know, not, not to harp on the same points that, you know, Michael and Faye already made around the iOS 14, but this has been a huge problem, um, you know, across brands, your, your brand marketers, it's made that tracking and attribution with Facebook, Instagram um, more difficult than ever. The other dynamic that you have, you know, coupling this uh, is that cookies are sunsetting. Um, and as Faye mentioned, CACs are, are skyrocketing. So, you know, what we're seeing is that pure D to C playbook just doesn't work anymore. So, you know, where Allbirds came up and you know, ran this entire playbook around just being pure D to C, it's getting too expensive to do so. Um, so we're seeing our customers move across channels and be really omni-channel. Um, so for example, you know, Branch the Furniture Company moving into West Helm. You have Maud the Sexual Wellness uh, Company, they're moving into Nordstrom and Sephora. And so we're seeing this across um, customers that you need to be omni-channel to reach your customers, um, but then it becomes more important than ever to be able to own your customer, to be able to drive these different retention strategies. So let's take a little bit of a look at specific shopper behavior, um, you know, tied to both Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and what we're seeing across the industry. So 18% of um, Amazon, 18% uh, of Black Friday dollars were spent on Amazon. I think we're all well aware of the growing power of Amazon and the scale that it could give brands pretty quickly. You know, it used to be this dynamic where the D2C brand didn't want to sell on Amazon because, you know, it wasn't on brand for them. But now Amazon makes up more than 50% of all of e-commerce um, and customer or brands are noticing that they need to be on Amazon to reach their customers. Um, so I think we could all agree as consumers, we're all using Amazon. It's a pretty powerful tool. Um, you know, as a brand, it's a powerful channel that you need to be on to reach your customer. That problem is that they do not share any of that data with you. Um, so you have no first party data for any sales uh, that you do on Amazon. Um, so that's, you know, a, a problem that you're probably dealing with. And then, you know, the other dynamic uh, is that, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, people like to shop in stores um, and they like to, you know, on, go on Saks, Target, Walmart. So a lot of your um, your customers are you know acquiring your product from channels where you do not know your customer, and this is a great acquisition channel for you. Um, so there's you know a couple of different ways that you could be thinking about the use of the QR code as you think about retail. You know, one is that you have finite packaging um, on display to tell your brand story. So thinking about the QR code to you know continue to tell your brand story. Um, and then the other is, you know, these retailers are fantastic opportunities for you to, you know, scale customer acquisition outside of just Facebook and Instagram. Um, but, you know, how do you then retain and know who that customer is? How do you acquire that, not just first party data, but you no know, zero party data um, from your customers? Because Amazon retail, they're actually a black box as it relates to your ability to connect with those customers. So, um, you know, what Bridge does is we help you uh, build these QR code activated mobile experiences with a couple of different key use cases. Um, so, you know, educate and engage your customer. So tell your brand story. You've just acquired a lot of new customers through Black Friday, Cyber Monday. You know, how do you make that, how do you make that customer feel really good about their, their purchase? And, you know, educate them about how to use the product effectively, you know, cut down on those customer success tickets. Um, acquire first party data. So that super value valuable email to, you know, grow and nurture your customers. You know, Faye talked about, um, you know, those customers that you acquired, you probably, you know, met them six months ago. So how do you, you know, continue to nurture those customers? Email is your best channel to do so. Um, that ultimate goal of driving loyalty and reorder. So let's take a, you know, look at a, a couple of case studies and, you know, what we're seeing across our customer base and how they're, you know, being effective um, throughout Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So there's a couple of different touch points that you can put your QR code on. And you want to think about your customer's journey, what they're like, what they're doing and how you can use a QR code to make that customer journey more like more efficient um, and then drive the results that you're looking for. So Sarcel, they're a beauty brand. Um, they have a QR code on an insert in their Amazon packaging where they're looking to acquire customer emails. They also have a QR code on the product itself um, where they're, you know, displaying different nutritional information, sorry, uh, you know, 
ingredient information about the product, um, and then also use information. So beauty brands, you know, those tutorial videos about how to use the product effectively um, gets really great engagement. Um, and then on the product itself, thinking about using, you know, reorder as that opportunity to, you know, when you're running out of your product, make it that seamless retention opportunity for that customer to purchase, you know, when they're thinking about that product. Um, you know, another, um, another, you know, case study here, you know, taking it post Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and, you know, looping in um, post pilot and how we've, you know, been working together to help continue to nurture, uh, to use QR codes and use mailers to nurture your customers. Um, and so, you know, this is one of our, our joint customers here, Bayblash. Um, they did a Black Friday, Cyber Monday win back campaign. Um, you know, one that was, you know, specifically focused on VIP, the other that was, you know, focused um, on just, you know, their general customer base. And collectively, they generated over $260,000 of revenue from this campaign, campaign, which is over a 24 times um, return on their spend there. So the ability to, you know, get out to your customers, deliver them that, you know, offline experience. And where the QR code becomes very valuable here is you can be super intentional about what you're driving that customer to do. So, you know, whether you want to embed a discount code directly via that QR code, whether you want to leverage a subscription integration to, you know, win back a post subscriber. Um, so you can make it really easy um, using that QR code for the customer to do exactly what um, what you what you're intending to them to do. You want to make it as easy as possible for the customer, and that's you know part of the um, part of what we think a lot about when we're helping build these mobile experiences for for your customers is how do you get that customer to the end experience as seamlessly as possible? Um, because I think we all know in a, a customer's journey, there's multiple opportunities for fall off in that conversion. Um, so how do you really incentivize um, and you know, uh, facilitate that easy conversion um, for that customers. So another dynamic that we see on Black Friday is that it is a big time to give gifts. Um, you know, I know I did it myself. Um, you know, you're aggregating that gift the gift list, um, and you know, actually 20% of Black Friday spend um, is actually on gifts. So. Um, you know, if those gifters bought from your D2C site, that's great because you have that gifters information. Um, but, you know, if, if that is not the end user of the product, you don't have information about that customer. Um, so, you know, you have no way to continue to nurture that relationship, um, that ultimate receiver of the gift. So, you know, one way that, you know, we think about like nurturing that um, that receiver of the gift is, is using a QR code. Um, so Canopy, one of our customers, um, you know, they're a humidifier product. It's highly gifted. Um, you know, I actually received a Canopy as a as a gift myself, um, and they're using QR codes for warranty registration to capture that end user information. So that warranty becomes the value transfer to the consumer. Um, Canopy gets that customer's email, and then the, you know the that direct relationship. Um, so you could think about, you know, if you have any sort of higher AOV product, how you can use a warranty or product registration to be that value transfer to the customer. You know, other ways that Canopy are using um, using our QR codes. So, you know, Humidifier, um, you know, has some different intricacies around how you set it up, how to use it properly. Um, so you can embed videos to, you know, make that post-purchase customer experience better so that they're using your product the right way um, and most effectively. And that's going to reduce your, your CX issues um, and then, you know, Canopy also has a QR code on the device itself. So they have a consumable component of their product, um, you know, filters and then, you know, diffuser uh, refills, which you can order uh, via via that QR code. Um, so the ability to, you know, seamlessly opt into subscription, um, you know, via our recharge integration um, or, you know, just reorder that consumable in nature. So think about, again, um, and I think Canopy does this really well, hitting the, the customer when they're thinking about that opportunity. So they're running out of filters, they open up their, their canopy humidifier, and that's where this the QR code is that you know has the call to action to reorder their filters. Um, and so making it really easy for that consumer on that on their journey and then you know ultimately um, creating more conversion and you know that repeat customer um, that you'd hope for. 
Um, and so, you know, what we allow you to do at Bridge is, you know, be really thoughtful about creating those campaign product or even SKU specific uh, QR code mobile experiences. So you can leverage our templates to, you know, create these different um, experience per product. Um, and what that will allow you to do is really minimize the burden on the consumer because a lot of the product information is already embedded in that QR code um, such that you can, you know, ask the minimal amount from that customer. What that will allow you to also do when you're tracking those analytics and engagements is be very specific about how different campaigns, different products, um, or even different content in your QR code experience are engaging. Um, and so one of the things that you'll be able to do when leveraging our platform is to see how that, um, see exactly what content your customers are engaging with. Um, so in the same way that you can test that with different landing pages on your on your website, you can start to you know, test this out of home, um, you know, your QR code experiences and, and what is working from a content perspective, um, you know, where brands are, are, are resonating or where consumers are resonating resonating more um, with your brand content. You know, similar, similarly to, you know, post pilots integration with Clavio, um, we help you, you know, really automate and, um, and, and leverage your tech stack um, that you're already working with. So we're a Shopify app, we're integrated with Clavio. So all of the emails that you capture will flow directly into your Shopify and Clavio accounts, um, actually tag whether they're net new um, or existing. So, you know, is this a customer that you've already, that has already signed up through, um, through Shopify? through Shopify, made a purchase through Shopify, or are they net new? Did you acquire them from an unowned channel such as, uh, you know, Amazon um, or or retail? So start to really think about, you know, the life, lifetime value of um, your net new customers. Um, and we allow you to, you know, automate and sync this information so that you can leverage that uh, in a, a really effective way. And finally, I just wanted to go through a couple of you know QR code best practices um, because they're they're definitely are are the right ways to do this and then the wrong ways to do this. You know, I will start with the wrong way. Um, if you just slap a QR code on a product or an insert um, and you have no call to action or it's not visible or it's you know in too busy of a location, that's not that's not going to be your best engagement. You want to be really thoughtful about making that QR code a central focus of your customer and telling the customer that there is value to them engaging with it. So putting that QR code in a visible location. Um, so I have you know Skur style on the right hand side here. They like they use the QR code actually in their call to action. Um, so they're a, a sponge brand. They're using these inserts for email capture through Amazon. Um, and they talk about a sponge so technologically advanced it has its own QR code. Um, and so they're getting a you know 30% scan to uh, span, scan to email capture rate um, just delivering content. They're not even delivering a, a, a discount by nature of just you know making it very clear that they want their customer to scan that QR code. So you don't need to make that that insert super busy because a lot of that information you can embed on that on that QR code. Um, so again, having that clear call to action, what we see uh, works best um, is when it you know has a little bit of your brand voice um, and is very obvious to that end customer. Um, and then finally, deliver relevant value transfer. Um, and so what we see working the best is a combination of content as well as some sort of transaction value for your customers. Um, and it really depends on the type of brand you are. So, you know, if you're a higher value um, item, we definitely recommend warranty um, or product registration. There's an existing kind of consumer behavior around that, and you're going to see your best engagement rates, uh, you know, from that value transfer. Um, but we're also seeing across CPG brands that content works super well. So so whether that be your know, recipe content, um, you know, videos on like product tutorials. So think about the content that's res resonating across your influencer campaigns, across your websites. And this is the type of content you can deliver in exchange for that customer's email um, to bring them into your direct ecosystem. Um, so I will, you know, finally wrap this up. Um, you know, we've included a, um, a free access to our white paper here. Um, so you can go to bridge.it slash white paper, or you can scan. Um, and basically this is our omni-channel playbook. So we've 
um, interviewed founders across um, across the industry about their best practices um, on building an omni-channel brand. Um, if there's something that we know, it is that omni-channel is going to be the future of what works for uh, what works for brands, both from the you know customers' perspective and you know channel uh, channel perspective, um, and then as you go omni-channel, how can you provide your customers with a consistent experience um, and you know own those customers so you can continue to build a long-term relationship with those customers? So thanks again, um, Kate from Bridge, and you know appreciate your your you listening. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, I'd now like to open it up to some questions. Um, if you have a question, please share it in the chat or Michael, Kate, or Faye. Give them a second here. Does anyone have it? Kate, Mike, Clark, Bay, do you guys have any questions for each other? I have a question for Faye. Um, Faye, I mean, I think you get the mm -hmm. best data kind of across um, across platforms for um, of all of us. What do you think, like, or what do you see when you're, you know, looking at a brand's data? See, like, are the most like low hanging fruit kind of easy wins um, that, that that you'd like to share? Yeah, um, you know, I think it really depends on the focus of the brand. You know, obviously we have high AOV brands that realize most of their LTV in one go. Um, and we have like brands that need to have multiple purchases from a customer to, to be profitable. So, uh, you know, for, for, I think for the high AOV ones, um, uh, having the right attribution set up, having the right data set up is very important. Um, um, so, so there's, there's usually a lot of the starting point for us is really helping the brands understand the levers that they have around uh, uh, what, what are the tool sets that are already in the data that they already own, you know, having visibility into how to look at UTMs and discount codes and stuff like that. And we do see a lot of high AOV products that have really huge uh, repeat purchase and subscription potentials. Um, so uh, one of our customers, um, the Iris Store, you know, they have a, uh, they're actually in the webinar right now, they have uh, a, a, an expensive like laser hair growth product, but shampoos and other type of consumables uh, are, are really great fit to, to that particular product. So, and then with um, repeat purchase brands, uh, really being able to segment out their customers in a way that makes sense, right? Looking at churn subscribers who are repeat purchasers, you know, at what order count are they generally churning at? Uh, what are some of the things that they're, they're being acquired with and, and coming back for? Uh, what can we understand about why these folks are churning away? Um, it is, is usually like pretty much every time uh, people haven't been able to look at that, not that they haven't wanted to, right? And, and also understanding the loyal customers, where were they, how were they acquired? What are they purchasing? Uh, what's keeping them coming back, right? Um, uh, and, and, and basically really tailoring your growth strategy and communication strategy to these people differently is really important. Um, so those are some of the things that we see. Awesome. Thank you, Faye. Oh, sorry. Uh, just, Go ahead, uh, Michael. I was, I was just going to add to what Faye said because I think it's such a powerful statement and, and really speaks to my days more as the on the operating side that there's such like the 80 20 rule going on in your business. If you look at, if you look at who's driving the bulk of your revenue, you can typically find these cohorts of customers that are your best customers and, and they're driving the bulk of your, your LTV and profitability. And if you use tools like source meeting to understand what makes, how, how did you acquire those customers and you focus your marketing efforts on those channels and acquire more of those customers as opposed to going broad and just acquiring any customer. It, it just really does remarkable things for your business in terms of improving your overall efficiency and profitability. Totally. Awesome. Thank you guys. It looks like we have another question here. Um, what about those customers that I didn't reach during Black Friday, Cyber Monday? 
how can I activate them before end of year? I mean, I, I can take, <laughs> I can tell you one way. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's definitely a way to get, I mean, you can get a direct mail campaign out, especially though, if you take even a, a Clavio segment, for example, folks that didn't open or, or convert off your Black Friday campaign. So narrow, the, narrow that audience to only people that you tried to hit and couldn't and hit them with a direct mail campaign by syncing that segment to Postpilot. There's just easy money on the table there. Like you will get an ROI on that campaign and mm -hmm. there's still time to do it. If you, you kind of hurry, uh, you, know, you can get a campaign out the door within a few days and it'll still arrive enough yeah. with enough time before Christmas if you're running a gift or a, or a Christmas campaign. And to tack on to that, I think what we're seeing is just extending the sales. Um, but instead of just extending the sales, maybe have some differentiation there, right? Maybe it's a deeper sale if you subscribe, for example, right? So have an intentionality around why we're extending the sale and what, what KPIs we're actually trying to hit, right? Do we want more subscribers or do we just kind of uh, uh, want to have that last bit of growth going to the end of the year? Um, but, uh, but definitely the sales are continuing because there will be a lot of people that missed it, you know? Um, for sure. Awesome. We have another question here for Postpilot. Are you seeing brands sending direct mail customers to a specific landing page or to the home page or product page? We're thinking about testing landing page specifics to direct mail campaigns. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Amanda. So you can do it a number of ways. Uh, typically, we do see a lot of brands that will use QR codes like Bridge and send directly to a specific experience. Uh, you want to have fallbacks in those cases, like you want to have something, you want to have an offer on uh, on the card that can be applied and you want to specify it on the card as well. But like you can have strong call to actions to do a QR code and take that to a specific landing page and encourage people to to go there uh, where you can then do a number of things. You can one, it's it's helpful for tracking purposes as as Kate mentioned, it's uh, you can personalize it more. You can have a, a specific offer. So there's a lot of good reasons to do that. Um, in terms of just getting like the most bang for your buck on the on the campaign, you, if you have a broader offer and you mention that on the card, it'll help with overall conversion rates. But then you send people using the QR to a specific landing page just for a more personalized experience once they once they act on that card. So um yeah it certainly would encourage you to to use a qr create an experience for that recipient makes them feel special have an offer that's broadly applicable enough that they can use it in a number of places and it'll get your overall conversion yeah i can add to that just on what we're seeing um with customers using um using uh, mailing campaigns so you know part of that like what you can do with the the landing pages like take some of the effort off of the customer. So you can list the discount on that mailer, but you could also embed it into the experience to drop the customer directly at checkout if you're you know, encouraging that customer to purchase. So it could be you know, at checkout for that specific product, or it could be you know, a step above where the discount is already applied. Um, you know, we are also seeing customers use it for you know, subscription win back specifically. So you know, allow like that QR code to facilitate that, sub like, that customer to subscribe. Um, so I think the the easier you can make it for the customer to you know do that action that you're looking to achieve. Um, I think that that's where um, being specific with the landing page because you're already getting the benefit of the like the brand um, kind of discovery by um, by doing that postcard in the first place. Yeah, it's a, those are great points, Kate. You articulated better than I did. Um, a lo lots of cool things you can do with QR codes aside from the landing page, like Kate mentioned, which is auto apply discounts, uh, drive them right back to cart on an abandoned cart campaign. Um, and uh, what was the third thing? Auto apply. Oh, subscriptions. Yeah, reactivate subscriptions. Like lots of cool stuff. And the more you can reduce friction by doing like scan here and we'll take 10% off your cart kind of thing the more effective these campaigns are. 
Awesome. One more question. Um, what are the best ways to track the value of customers acquired during Black Friday, Cyber Monday over time? Uh, yes, I, I can t try to take this. Yeah, so I think um, uh, being able to look at their uh, acquisition order with a particular Black Friday related discount code, UTM param, landing page, what have you, um, is going to be pretty key. And then also looking at previous years equivalent of that to make sure that, you know, there is a benchmarking and comparison in terms of are we improving or uh, are we able to acquire customers during this time that are coming back over time with LTE increases or, uh, you know, cause we, we do see a lot of brands during this time acquire a customer once and they don't come back. So have, beginning to have an opinion on that uh, can be very powerful. Yeah. There. So just going to add to that really uh, to what Faye said. So have those discount codes um, and then do a postmortem right now where it's fresh. Um, so that you can organize the information, organize your learnings, organize those specific cohorts um, so that you, you know, have those and can learn from those, uh, those customer cohorts going forward. Awesome. Is there anything else, uh, Michael, Kate, Faye, you want to add before we wrap up here? Thank you for everyone for joining. It was, it was great um, chatting Faye and Michael with you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, appreciate it. Hope every, hope everybody had a great Black Friday and has a really strong rest of the year. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Michael. Thanks. Um, yeah, likewise. Hopefully we can um, do more, do more business together. Seems like we've had a couple, quite a bit of overlap awesome. recently. Yeah, which is great. And I know Ben's been, um, Ben's driving a lot of that and, and sounds like there's some really good case studies that, that we should work on writing up like that babe one. Is, yeah, that's is killer. Um, that is insane, <laughs> but cool. Sounds good. Nice to, nice chatting with you. Bye. You too. Talk to you soon.